We are coming at you, Coast to Coast AM, uh, live from Las Vegas. Uh, our guest uh, is John. for the next half hour is John Lear. He's a retired airline captain, former CIA pilot, son of the famous inventor of the Lear jet. Uh, John has flown over 150 test aircraft. He's won every, every award granted by the uh, FAA, holds 18 world speed records, and is the unofficial conspiracy correspondent uh, f- for me on this program. Uh, we're going to be right back to ask John about a secret submarine base out here in the middle of the desert, as well as about uh, Area 52, Bob Lazar, Element 115, and maybe torture planes. So don't go away. This is Coast to Coast AM. I'm George Knapp, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. I'm George Knapp, your guest host, and I'm joined by John Lear, the one and only. John, before we can jump back to talking about this secret submarine base, uh, you sent me an email o- over the weekend uh, saying, Hey, yeah, I'll join you for the show on Sunday, but I'm going out to my mine. What, what's the deal on the mine? Uh, when I retired from uh, flying, I had this little uh, gold mine up at uh, Gold Butte, Nevada, and uh, got it. Uh, it took me about uh, seven years to get it going, and uh, finally got it going. Rebuilt the whole thing, and, uh, and it was going there for a while. But in 2005, I made I uh, because of, there was a huge fire up there, which didn't affect my property. Uh, I forgot to file the thirty dollar uh, registration fee that you've got to do for a claim every year. And uh, uh, last a few months ago, the BLM found out about it and they said, no, 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 you you forgot to file, so you can't have your claims anymore. So it was a great operation. I spent a lot of money, but it's all over now. Well, I don't understand. Uh, somebody else grabbed it from you, or, or no, they're no. giving it up to somebody, or they just no, no. keep it? It's just that during the time I had it, uh, they filed what they call a area ACEC, Area of Critical Environmental Concern, uh, for a million acres that they're making in Clark County for a turtle habitat. And uh, when it, it exempted my mind, but when I missed the filing, you know, for the, the few days that I did, the uh, mouse trap snapped shut. And uh, there was no way to get back. Now I appealed to the Interior Board of uh, Appeals, the uh, Land Appeals, uh, twice, and even went to Senator Reid, and nobody could do anything about it. So, you know, life is a series of challenges, and it's not whether you win or lose; it's how you meet the challenge. So now I have to clean it up, and uh, that's all there is to that. I'll press on and do other things. Oh man, that's a shame. Maybe you and I will talk af- off the air and I'll see if I can help you in any way. Let's jump back to this uh, discussion about the the saucer, the not, submarine base. Uh, you know, I drove up to your your beautiful home the other day, and and you and I haven't had a face to face chat in a while. It's a great view of Las Vegas from where you are up on the mountain there, and uh, we started talking about all kinds of things. And I it occurred to me that I have driven by this submarine base probably a hundred times, and it's always always been curious to me what a submarine base is doing out in the middle of the desert, an undersea warfare center, and. And you actually, you stopped there to sort of uh, take some photos, right, and got ran away? Yeah, you know, I've been driving up there for 30 years. My folks lived up in Reno, and I go back and forth. And I've seen this there uh, and seen the sign. And, you know, up until about three years ago, it was the Naval Undersea Warfare Training Center. And then they took the the word training out. And, uh, you know, uh, secrets... Uh, it, it takes a long time to put a puzzle together, and what you do is you take information from there and information from there and listen to people, and you read, and, you know, you're not going to find this on the Internet. You have to do it by, you know, personal contact and, uh, and listen very carefully and read very carefully, and uh, that's how I found out about it. And, you know, I did a lot of flying, and a lot of the people I flew, were, uh, flew with were ex-military, and they, they always give, you know, some little secret and they don't know the, you know, they really don't know they're doing it. But, but uh, you put that together and say, ah, okay, I got that one. But yeah, the other day I was come back from Reno, and I just wanted to uh, take a picture of the sign right alongside the road. You know, it's a, it's a public, it's a sign. It just says Naval Undersea Warfare Center. And I pulled over the road and pulled up my ca- uh, camera to the window. And just before I shot the picture, I heard a whole bunch of screaming and yelling. I looked at the little guard shack, and they're waving their arms and running over to me. So I, I 
put it in drive, and I just pulled across the road, and I said, you know, is there a problem? And there was a lady there screaming, you can't take pictures here. This is a you know, secret base, and, and uh, I could call the MPs and have, you, have your campers, uh, camera confiscated. And, and I said, well, you know, I didn't mean any harm. I mean, everybody looks at this sign. There's, I'm not taking a picture of anything inside. There's nothing to take a picture of. She says, I don't care about that. You can't do this, and you turn right around. I said, well, do you think I could get a tour? And she said, no, no, you can't get a tour. <laughs> and, you know, cool. So, you know, I drove off, but it seemed a, a lot of uh, fuss. If, if I was running that base, I would certainly not do something like that. If somebody drove up, I'd say, hey, can I help you, sir? You know, uh, you know, we're not giving tours today, but maybe if you write us, we'll give you tours. But sure, take a picture of sign, whatever you want. Make it real low key there. Don't make a, a big fuss about it, because if you make a fuss about it, then somebody's going to wonder, what the heck is in there anyway? Well, yeah, it's like Area 51, you know, the, the, the fact that everybody knew that base was out there. There had been little newspaper articles about it uh, for a lot of years, and it didn't really start getting interesting until they started denying that the base was out there. Right, and you'll remember that it was 18 years ago that you released the information on Bob Lazar. And, you know, when I go on the different uh, forums, uh, like AboveTopSecret.com, uh, a lot of the people, you know, they don't believe the Bob Lazar story. And when I look back, uh, I don't blame them. Because, you know, you and I lived it. We were with Bob. We knew Bob. We were in his house. We saw him leave for work. We went up and saw the flying saucers fly. You know, and it was real to us. But 18 years later, uh, you see the story on the Internet. Hey, guy works on flying saucers for the U.S. government. They're not going to believe that. Yeah. It's amazing how much water is under the bridge since then. We'll come back to Bob in just a second. I want to, uh, uh, to stick with the, the sub base for a second now. Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, on the John Lear scale of credibility, how how uh, how much do you believe, 1 being least, 10 being most? 10. That that this this the shaft goes 1,400 feet down into it, and people get on submarines in Hawthorne and go to the Pacific Ocean? No doubt about it. And, uh, you know, there's many Navy facilities around the United States. I think the United States, uh, there's a, a vast uh, undersea area. I don't know how far it goes. Uh, I suspect that... Uh, there's access uh, up in Idaho to uh, Lake Pendere, probably a Kirtland, where a lot of Navy research goes. Uh, you know, I had a friend here who was in charge of the Lake Mead Naval Air Station or Naval Air Base here, and he told me of a secret facility in Lake Tahoe. And uh, just today, I was talking with a friend. He said, "Oh yeah, that uh, that uh, is a real secret base." And he said he told me the story about Jacques Cousteau, who went down uh, in the submarine in 1975 to see what was down there, and when he came up, uh, they said, what'd you see? And he said, the world is not ready to know what I saw. You know, and that's on record. So, Well, why keep, why keep this secret? You, you said that there's more than one of these kinds of facilities all around the, on the country, like Ohio and places like that is what you told me when we uh, chatted. Uh, but why keep this a secret? If you can get to a submarine and get to the ocean from down there, what's, what's the big deal? Everything's a secret, George. There, there, everything that the military does is a secret, you know. Uh, you know that in the last few years I've been working on uh, our bases on the moon. We've been on the moon since 1962. We've been uh, on Mars since 1966. We have at least six space stations orbiting Earth. Uh, you know, next time you watch uh, Discovery take off, it takes off on the 23rd. Just notice the time that it takes off from Kennedy and docks with a, with a space station. It's usually about 72 hours. Now, it doesn't take that long to go up there and dock, and what they're doing is they're stopping at the other space stations, dropping off supplies. When they get to the ISS, uh, usually a few days before, the Russians have sent two progress rockets up there, and that cargo is put back onto the uh, U.S. space shuttle, and then when they uh, undock, guess how long it takes them to get back to Kennedy? 72 hours. Well, you know, the trip is only 20 minutes, so they got to be doing something else, and what they're doing is they're taking those supplies that Progress brought up and going back through the line, un you know, supplying the, uh, the other uh, space stations. You know, Isn't there, like this, it's, you know, going on, and, and it's a secret. We'll never know about it. And I'll tell you one thing. I met the other day with an Air Force uh, intelligence guy and, uh, and uh, my associate, Ron Schmidt. And we came up in my den. We talked for several days. And at the end of this time, I said, you know, uh, fellas, on a scale of 0 to 100, 0 meaning we don't know anything, 100 being we know everything the government knows. Where do you think we are? And our general consensus was between 0.5 and 0.7. Now, since that time, I've revised the scale to 0 to 1,000 
being we still know only 0.5 to 0.7. We know nothing. Now, you mentioned uh, St. Uh, Louis. You know, there's a huge underground uh, submarine uh, testing center there, and I think they access, it, access that by going up, uh, up, up the Mississippi. This, this these, stuff you know, about all these stories I'm telling you can be found on AboveTopSecret.com. The guy posted, you know, when I posted the original story on Hawthorne, he came on and said, you know, my dad worked uh, on an underground uh, uh, facility that uh, was a huge uh, body of water there in St. Louis, and he worked on nuclear submarines. You know, I don't have trouble believing the idea that we could have secret uh, satellites up there or space stations. I mean, that's technically feasible. A lot of folks don't want to believe about UFOs or whatever. That is something we could do. What I don't understand is why there's no way to detect it. Shouldn't, shouldn't someone have access to that information to be able to say, aha, we see it up there? No. Well, yeah, you could see the um, space stations. There, There's many photos of them, uh, film, that a guy took. In Santa Monica, I think they call him uh, Santa Monica John, and that's not me. Uh, and he had a, a telescope that would track satellites. And what he did is he followed them, and they're amazing satellites. I mean, and this this stuff is on you can uh, g you know get it on uh, YouTube or AboveTopSecret.com. But there's got to be at least ten different film clips of these huge space stations, you know, orbiting Earth. Let's go back to Bob Lazar for a second. Have you been in touch with Bob uh, regarding the uh, the matter I mentioned earlier, the uh, the hassle he's been getting from the government about the sale of various kinds of chemicals and scientific equipment? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, on uh, on on the web uh, um, ATS, uh, the the story came up of the 115 and uh, the experiment we did, and I was trying to tell him how we did it, and I forgot what we used in the bell jar. Uh, to uh, for the gamma, alpha, and uh, beta rays, and I uh, I emailed him and he said it was thorium oxide, and uh, and also he emailed me that uh, I'm not sure whether it was the same CBS production, but I saw one of them that uh, that had a real good production on what he does and and how science is falling behind, and it's really not falling behind. I mean, our secret government is so far ahead that uh, people just wouldn't believe what we're doing now. Well, just to bring uh, the listeners up to date who may not know the story, Element 115 is what Bob Lazar claimed back in 1989 is the fuel used to power flying saucers that our government somehow acquired from some other race. And uh, and uh, Lazar had said that he had a piece of it for a time period, and he even uh, conducted some experiments that, that John Lear witnessed and uh, and which I have on videotape. And one of these days i got to find that tape for you, John. Yeah, listen, all you guys, you hear what George Knapp says? He has the videotape. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> that might have been a mistake, huh? Um, but but have you been in touch with Bob about the legal difficulties he's undergoing with, with regard to what he sells on on his company? Yeah, you know, he just had the court case and uh, finished that up, and now he's being real careful. But, uh, you know, the, some of the people that post say that the stuff that he got busted for is ridiculous. Everybody uses that stuff. It's not dangerous at all. What uh, what was the end result? Did he uh, get punished? Yeah, I think he got two uh, seventy five hundred dollar fine and two years probation. And is he not allowed to sell that stuff anymore? No. Uh, oh, okay. No, they're what, down on all that let, stuff. Let's talk briefly about Area fifty two. I, I mentioned it in regard to the wild horses that died up there, but I'm also working on some stories about what goes on out at that place, the Tonopah Test Range. It's been a facility in place there uh, for a long time, a sister facility to Area 51. What do you think is going on out there now? Well, the real secret uh, is the uh, facility uh, halfway between Tonopah and Groom Lake, and uh, that's called Sandia. And Sandia was uh, con initially constructed between 1980 and 1987. It's a huge, huge underground base that's in what they call Area 19 on the Paiute Mesa. Uh, there's a couple of runways there. Uh, and there's also a couple of runways, I think, that are called uh, Station 9 uh, out in the uh, uh, in the flatlands there. And it's just an enormous operation, and, and they've done a good job keeping it secret. And, and one of the ways they've kept it secret is because everybody watches the special projects, airplanes, you know, the red and white uh, 737s. And, you know, it's kind of hard to, uh, to shuffle a couple of thousand people into a secret base without anybody knowing it. So what they did is they built these underground high-speed trains that go from Las Vegas to Sandia, 
and they uh, what they did is they have the entrances if you can believe this under two or three of the major hotels and they the workers they just pull up into guest parking for the hotel walk in you know some nondescript door uh, there'll be some you know elevator that the, only they have access to and they go down and they get on this tram or this uh, high-speed train that goes up to Sandia Got to tell you, John, I have trouble with that part of it. I have no doubt that they have, could have underground facilities out there, but the underground train part, I mean, for one thing, if that's true, uh, the people of Las Vegas should really be ticked off because we could use that this train technology to solve some of our woeful traffic problems. You know, George, since the 60s, the, the uh, Navy has had a high-speed trade system that goes at least nationwide and probably worldwide. And the, the underground... Uh, tunnels that we have that people drive daily go thousands of miles. There's so much stuff going underground that nobody has a clue. And when you say you have trouble with this, remember when I brought you the Bob Lazar story, uh, you had trouble with that. And not only that, Bob Lazar had the, <laughs> the same problem when I initially started talking about saucers up at Area 51. He said, this is ridiculous. He said, I was at Los Alamos. I had a cute clearance. If that would have been, if that was true, I would have known it. And that's the exact words that Bob Lazar told me. And then, you know, four or five months later, you know, one thing led to another. He came up to my house, sat in the chair, and he said, John, he said, I saw a disc today. And, and I said, theirs or ours? He said, theirs. And I said, well, what are you doing here? And he said, because you've taken so much uh, crap over this, I wanted to tell you it's true. One more question about uh, Tonopah, though, is what is it that they're doing out there? They've got these underground facilities, and they're secretly flying in employees. What are they well, working on? You know, I don't know exactly. I think that that may be where NORAD is moving. So, you know, I don't have, uh, I don't know exactly what they're doing. You said they've got something in, enough to store thousands or ho host thousands of troops? Yeah, they have those uh, five uh, circular facilities, and they were digging those when Bob was here. Um, and uh, they go about a mile underground, and uh, each one can hold, I think, 25,000 combat troops uh, and their officers, and there's five of them. And the reason we knew is one of the guys we knew drove the dump truck, and what they do is they'd set off a, um, a, a clean, if you can believe it, clean nuclear bomb to make the original hole. Then they'd tunnel down there, and they'd head this road uh, on the side of this uh of this huge hole, and they take the concrete down there and and uh, start uh, building this entire facility. And there's five of those, and that's separate from the uh, Sandia part. Years ago, uh, before the world knew about the stealth fighter, you and Jim Goodall and John Andrews used to go up to Tonopah, sit around outside the fence, uh, fence uh, pull out your lawn chair, and and watch for it because. Uh, you know, the people of Tonopah had been seeing these things flying in the sky for a long time. They kept their mouths shut. You guys found out about it, and you saw them, didn't you? Yeah, we went out there with our lawn chairs and uh, Diet Pepsi, and it was usually at sunset because they didn't fly during the day. And uh, once the security guards came up and they said, hey, you guys can't be there, and we said, sure we can. This is BLM land. And the guards would come over and say, well, now, wait a minute, we'll have to see some ID. And so we showed him our ID, and I heard him talking to his um, little radio phone there, and he said, uh, it's okay, it's only Lear and Goodall. <laughs> but, I mean, it shows that secrets can and are kept. Absolutely, positively. I mean, there are so many secrets. It's just really interesting. I want to ask you about one other uh, uh, subject, if we have time to get into this. It's about torture planes. John, you flew for the CIA. Uh, you know how it works. You've read the same news accounts about torture. There's a there's a movie that opened up this weekend called Rendition, uh, you know, in which uh, these private shell companies are used by the CIA and other intelligence agencies. They go and snatch people up off the suspected terrorists up off the street, take them to hidden prisons, torture them. Um, what do you make of that? Well, I don't doubt it at all. You know, I've been out of the, the business for, uh, or, you know, I've been out of flying for seven years, and, and I haven't uh, done anything for the agency since 1983. But, you know, uh, that stuff goes on. Uh, just the idea of uh, America being the nation of the good guys, does it, uh, does it bother you? Or you, you think there's practical uses for that? No, there's no practical uses. The uh, the whole war on terrorism is a scam. It never happened. Never, you know, it was all stuff that we did to ourselves. It just it doesn't exist. It's uh, it's a perpetuation of uh, the original uh, report in 1960, the report from Iron Mountain that, that the economy can only be sustained uh, on a wartime basis. 
and so we have to create wars, and that's the only reason we did this. Well, that's a lot to chew on there. We'll have to have you back, and we can get into that and uh, and some more. So you know, start digging up some more conspiracies, John. We'll have you on and again in a, in a couple of months. Okay, thanks, George. All right, thank you. We'll be uh, coming back. We'll be joined by British author Tim Good. Talk about UFOs, government secrets, conspiracies. Stick uh, around. I'm George Knapp. This is Coast to Coast AM. Open Minds Radio is the UFO news authority, presenting evidence and the latest news regarding the UFO phenomenon. Here's your host, Alejandro Rojas. Hey, that's me, Alejandro Rojas, and you're listening to Open Minds Radio. Our intro by the Honorable, if you can say that, I'm not sure how you even get the title, Honorable Bob Dean, who always just sounds so wise, like he thinks out every word very carefully, which I don't. I should, because that's how you get in trouble when you don't think about what you're going to say very carefully. We have on the show today, and I'm so excited about it, Travis Walton. So luckily... I have known him for a few years now, and uh, he's a very interesting fella. And if you've seen the movie Fire in the Sky, then you know who I'm talking about, which most of you probably have. And uh, it's the story of Travis Walton, a gentleman who was with some buddies uh, while he was logging, really co-workers, because they weren't all buddies. In fact, one of them, I guess, kind of, they didn't get along too well. When they went to go look at a UFO in the forest, and it Travis... Try, decided to be cool and run out there, and, and it beamed him, and everybody freaked and ran, and, and he was essentially gone for five days. And I don't want to give away too much of the story because we'll talk to Travis about that. But if you've seen the movie, it's all pretty accurate. It all sticks pretty close to what really happened except for what happened on the ship because it created this real dark, ugly environment on this ship where you know he was drug around this this dirty area and there were body parts and just all this ridiculous stuff and that's not what he uh, remembers happening at all so we'll talk to him about what really happened and why the movie didn't portray what really happened because i think that would have been more interesting but hollywood being the way it is this is you know the home of of reality television and some of this Sookie, is that her name, on the New Jersey Shore people and some of that awful stuff they have on TV? I don't think they always make the best uh, decisions uh, when they're choosing what they're going to do in Hollywood. But we'll talk about how that came about, and it's really interesting, uh, especially what happened on the show. And you'll get a sense of what Travis is like, because if you haven't met him, and I know not many people have been able to meet him, he does speaking conferences he he hadn't been doing that much but he has been doing that more lately but you'll see he's a real down-to-earth person just kind of your regular guy out there which you would think um you know maybe a a logger would be like and i know living in arizona this happened in arizona not too far away i now have met the guy who sold me my house essentially he was a company that sold me my house but the guy in charge of customer service he was from the town that this happened at and he said you know these are the type of people that that they don't lie lying is a very foreign to these guys if they tell you something it's the real deal they're not kind of jokesters and everything so i'm really excited to talk about travis and really excited to share some of what's happened to him with you all i think you're going to find this all very very interesting and if you haven't seen the movie you got to race out and see it and if you have maybe it'll inspire you to go watch it again but uh, we'll also talk about Travis's updated book which goes over everything that happened here and how you will be able to get that book so I'm very excited about this great show today I hope everyone had some wonderful holidays Uh, you know it's always nice to get so many days off and rest and that's what I like of course the traveling part isn't very restful in fact, on, on the plane back from Colorado, my home, there's probably more children on this plane than has, I've ever experienced in my life. It was as if you were hanging out in the play area in a McDonald's. But luckily, I am a master meditator, and I was able to phase it all out. Unfortunately, other people were not, and uh, it gets rough traveling 
during the holidays. So I recommend everybody, if you travel, practice some meditation. It'll help. Other things going on. Of course, we've got the radio show on High Definition on YouTube. To Check that out. We're also uh, putting new videos up there all the time. And thank you to some of our new subscribers on YouTube. We got a bunch over the holiday weekend, so a bunch of you must have been sitting by the computer checking out some of those videos, some very interesting UFO videos, some archival stuff from the Wendell Stevens archives that dates back to decades ago, but also some new stuff as well. In fact, you know, I'd love more input on this weird video that I got from these gentlemen who were in Las Vegas a couple of years ago and got this just weird light that was kind of floating around the the New York, New York um, roller coaster and flying above uh, the, the strip there. It was very strange. Check that out and see what you think there. And it's hard to even say it's UFO because it was flying, but it's almost ghostly. Like an like a ghost cruising around above Las Vegas. That's scary. So very interesting video. Check that out. Of course, we've got the UFO Congress coming up here very, very soon, which it, it's another reason why it was good to have a few days off because stress levels around here were getting pretty high before we went on vacation. And uh, people, because of course I'm always very nice and polite to everyone, but people started being mean to me and snapping at me and Jason threw a mug at my head and I barely dodged it because he was getting real frustrated and and I just, I'm like, hey, come on, man, chill out. Just kidding. Of course, we all get stressed and probably drinking all the coffee we drink doesn't help. So uh, it was good to have a relaxing time. So now we can start to um, start at a mellow level and increase our stress will probably start going up before. But at least I have a few days before mugs are going to start flying around the office again. But the Congress is going to be so much fun. The reason why... We uh, are, it's getting so hectic because we've really tackled a lot here. We're putting on a lot of different events. We've got something like 28 speakers. And this is a combination of people speaking together or doing some Q&A and stuff like that. Something like 28 or 29 speakers coming to this thing, fitting them into five days. It's going to be just this wild roller coaster of edu ufological education. And, I mean, if you're a skeptic, if you have a family member that's a skeptic, bring them to the conference because I don't know how you can go through this thing and, and come out the other end being skeptical still. We've got all of these military people being uh, that are talking. We've got, uh, you know, with their personal experiences with UFOs, in one case someone touching um, this strange craft on the ground. And, and some of these are officers. In fact, we have the highest ranking military officer who had an experience who is, is talking right now, and that's a colonel. We have uh, Paul Hellyer, of course, who is the defense minister of Canada. I mean, that's he was working for the, the prime minister there. That's, that's big time. He'll be there talking about his experiences. It's going to be very exciting. And the rooms are booking. I, I told you guys, and I think some of you listened to me, to book your rooms early, which you've done. And so the main hotel is almost all booked up. But luckily... There are more hotels in this town of Fountain Hills. I was excited because I was thinking this is going to be really fun how we're going to have this whole hotel to ourselves and we're going to take it over and it's going to be like this UFO um, you know, event where we're all hanging out with each other and, and everybody in the hotel is a UFO person. But now it's getting bigger than I expected. Now we're taking over the whole town of Fountain Hills. So, you know, now we're having people book hotel rooms in these other hotels that are just around the corner, free shuttle away. And so now we have the whole town. So this is kind of fun. This is going to be like Telluride or something, you know, like these these film festivals where everybody's coming to this little pretty beautiful town with all of the these, these nice amenities and taking over the town, but for UFOs. So this is really awesome. It's UFO town and... Fountain Hills, we're taking it over, so don't worry. Like I said, you know, if you need some advice, if, if for some reason you call and the hotel is booked, let us know. We'll get you to some of the other places. Uh, really nice hotels out there. They're all really nice, and there's shuttles that go back and forth. So 
it's not going to be a problem. You're going to have a blast no matter where you are. And just last week, too, this is exciting. We, were, we had in um, a gentleman who is a Hopi Indian, and he is helping organize all of the uh, artists that go out, that uh, come to the Fort McDowell area. So he's going to have, we're going to have a lot of Hopi artisans that are going to be there selling their stuff. Um, so we're going to have a strong Native American presence, which is always wonderful. And uh, for those of you who are from like the East Coast, you know, you don't live out here in the Southwest like we do. We see all this beautiful artwork all the time. It'll be a real treat for you because you're going to be able to come here, meet those artists, uh, meet some of the Native Americans and talk about their work and uh, purchase some really nice stuff there. So this is going to be a lot of fun. And uh, we've talked about the film festival that's related to this. And luckily, we've gotten a lot more entries for films as well. So if if you have an entry, you got to get that to us real quick. In fact, it might have closed already. But uh, get those films to us real quick. Call us tomorrow if you have a film you want to enter and let us know because uh, we got to get those in real soon here. But we've got a lot of great entries, and so that's going to be a lot of fun as well. And we've got the new EBE statuettes being created right now. And I hope, you know, um, they were into in going to try to incorporate some anti-grab technology in them. So, and telepathic. You've heard of remote control, those helicopters you see in the mall that they're flying around. Think of ha these statues having an anti-grab sort of propulsion and you control it with your mind. That's where we're headed <laughs> one day. It might be 10 years from now, but one day we're going to get these little statuettes to fly. So that's what's going on in Open Minds world. We have a lot going on, a lot of fun. And in the rest of the world, they're UFO crazy as usual, and we've got a lot of UFO news that's gone on in some of the uh, some headlines in the regular conventional media. And we have this extraordinary fellow named Jason McClellan here to share with us some of those UFO headlines. Jason, how are you, buddy? Hello, Alejandro, and greetings, everyone. This is your Open Minds News Brief for Monday, January 3rd, the first Open Minds News Brief for 2011. Nice. In 2010, the newly discovered planet Gliese 581G was announced to be a good candidate for extraterrestrial life. Now, researchers are saying the same thing about another planet in the Gliese 581 solar system. According to new atmospheric modeling research, the planet Gliese 581d, like its neighbor Gliese 581g, may lie in the star's habitable zone, the region where a planet's temperature can sustain liquid water on its surface. The new research supports similar studies conducted earlier in 2010. So Alejandro, it looks like the Gliese 581 solar system is the place to be if we're going to find extraterrestrial life. I just I always think about it, especially watching like nature, you know, and all the diversity of the animals on this planet. I can just imagine the animals on other planets. It's got to be extraordinary. I can't even start to imagine it. And it the beautiful be green incredible. women. Green women? On I, Star Trek. Okay. I can say the green women were probably beautiful. They're yep, that'll be wonderful to visit. This was big news. Previously, secret documents relating to UFOs were released by the New Zealand Defense Force a couple weeks ago. More than 2,000 pages of UFO documents were released by New Zealand's government in response to the public pressure of requests under freedom of information laws. The documents contain eyewitness accounts dating back to the early 1950s, including reports from airline passengers, pilots, Air Force personnel, and even a New Zealand pr prime minister. Many of the reports contained in these files include sketches of UFOs and extraterrestrial beings, but the most detailed reports are from pilots who reported mysterious lights or objects in the sky. Now, people got really excited about the release of this information, but it's important to point out that New Zealand says they didn't actually investigate any of these sightings. They just collected the sightings. Right. It's just interesting that they would these would be classified documents, yet they're not doing anything with them and not – supposedly not taking them that seriously, but obviously they, they did to classify them. But the thing I found the most interesting about the release of these files is 
they contain information um, that the response, the, the letter response or email response to the people submitting the citing reports. They responded to every single one, and they responded in a very professional manner. Mm -hmm. Not in some of these things sounded pretty ridiculous. Yeah, but the responses were always, "Thank you. That's a very interesting sighting. That's a very interesting image or sketch you sent us. Thank you very much. We'll mm -hmm. look at it." It's kind of like the UF, the UK files. They were kind of similar because they had a lot of responses in there where they were very polite. But uh, unfortunately, the responses were similar, such as, you know, if it was something ridiculous, it'd be very polite. Oh, thank you for your report. Uh, we didn't find anything that would um, be of defense interest. But uh, but then when the sightings were extraordinary, like pilots reporting the giant triangle that, that flies at them or they have to steer their plane off course to get out of the way of this thing, they give the same response. Well, thank you for your report, but we didn't find this to be of defense significance. So it's interesting. It's great that they're they're putting this stuff out, but uh, I wonder, of course, just like with all of these cases, some of them do seem to be of concern. So I wonder if they did have some uh, documents that are still secret on some research that they actually did conduct. I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. And there was a whole, a very broad range of things contained in these files. You know, from extraterrestrial types of extraterrestrial beings, encounters with extraterrestrial beings. Um, chemtrails, mm -hmm. just a variety of things. It was it was fun to look through them, and, and there are some really pretty cool illustrations in there, too. Yeah, we'll have it up soon. We'll write something about this, but you can look into it. And what's interesting, one of the skeptics uh, from Discovery News uh, even wrote, you know, that this is a case that he's interested in, but the Kaikoura case, there was a lot more on this case. And this is a really good case of some pilots. Uh, who had some sightings out there. So the Kaikoura sightings are really interesting, and we don't have a story up that on that on that now, but we'll get one up really soon. Cool. In other news, Stanley Fulham, a retired Royal Canadian Air Force captain and UFO researcher, died at the age of 87 on December 19, 2010, after reportedly losing a battle with cancer. Fulham gained recent attention with his book, Challenges of Change, in which he predicted several UFO appearances. One of these predictions stated that UFOs would appear over several major cities on October 13, 2010, and because of this prediction, Fulham has been given credit by some for the UFOs that appeared over New York City on October 13. He made other predictions about sightings that will supposedly happen this month, first in Moscow, then in London. Yeah, we'll see if he's right. It's, it's unfortunate he passed away, but I know he's been sick for some time. In fact, some people speculated that he started talking because he was sick. But uh, if you go read his writings, I mean, he had a lot to say. He had a lot of channeling that he was doing and speaking with extraterrestrials and things like that. Well, this guy had an interesting uh, work history, too. He mm -hmm. worked for NORAD. and Yeah, he actually did. Um, mm -hmm. But again, uh, you, you know, I, I think we said it before, but I think people sort of unfairly give him credit for the New York sightings when his prediction actually stated that UFOs would appear over Multiple, multiple cities. major yeah. cities in the around the world or something. And that's still a controversial sighting because, of course, the video that was taken does look like it was balloons and, and at the fear of, you know, our, our uh, chat room lit up when we talked about that last right. time. But it does seem like, you know, there were supposedly many reports from people around town seeing other things. So maybe there were um, other things. certainly UFOs possible seen. there were multiple things in the sky during yeah. that October 13th sighting. But, and again, about the, these... Uh, Moscow and London predictions for this month. Yeah. Again, I mean, more yeah. than likely there will be sightings Russia in both Moscow and London because yeah. there always are. In so both it, towns, it's there's safe, a lot of sightings. It's safe to say that this month you'll have a sighting in Moscow and then in London. Yeah. So. I can predict right now there will be sightings next week in Tucson and in Phoenix. I think you're probably right with that. I doubt you'll be given credit, though. Dang. No fair. A couple weeks ago, the Russian news site Pravda reported that the U.S. organization SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, had released a statement announcing the detection of three giant spaceships heading towards Earth. These ships will supposedly reach Earth in December 2012. Dun, dun, dun. It's unclear but probable that Pravda got this information from an Examiner.com article that was published back on December 8th, which cites a SETI astrophysicist as the source of the information. But the astrophysicist cited doesn't seem to even exist. 
just one of the several red flags that makes this story seem completely fabricated. Mm -hmm. And which one of them? Oh, it was the um, bad science uh, guy from bad, one of the major news. Was bad he astronomy. Discovered? Yeah, bad astronomy. Yeah. Can't forget. I can't remember which site he writes for. I don't think it's it's something like Discover or something. I think it's Discover. Like that. Yeah. But yeah, he had friends in SETI, and he investigated this to find that yeah, this guy didn't exist at all. So yeah, there was a lot of talk back and forth about whether or not this guy actually existed at mm -hmm. SETI. So he's friends with Seth Shostak, a senior yep. astronomer at SETI, and Seth actually checked with the. Uh, human resources at SETI, and they had no record of this guy. Mm -hmm. And they said it's possible he was an intern here or something, but he's definitely not an astrophysicist here at SETI. Yeah. So, so which is good because I don't want three UFOs to come here and blow us up in December 2012. I don't either. And I think that's sort of convenient that this story <laughs> claimed the uh, December mm -hmm. 2012 as the target date these ships would arrive especially now because the movies that we're hearing about aren't coming out until after 2012 and i want to see some of these movies i think the hobbit i need to see the hobbit and that's not coming out till like 2013 and i think it's a bunch of 2012 hype and people making up stories it's unfortunate and this is a story that got a lot of major press yeah a lot of people latched on yep. to it it spread around and of mm -hmm. course they have to report that oh we found out that this guy doesn't even exist mm -hmm. People who have examined, worked on Hubble images, have looked at these images of these so-called spaceships, and they're just image defects. Mm -hmm. Sort of gives a bad name to, to any Yeah, research. you know, yep, just people have to be a little more careful. It's interesting because I was watching Fred Burks and his talk from mm -hmm. uh, the, he's an examiner, the intelligence examiner, and he was talking about how you just have to be really careful with these things, you know, just um. Uh, take it all with a grain of salt, and but his point being that even if it looks real, it could be disinformation, so it's hard to tell. It is hard to tell. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of witnesses reported seeing strange lights in the sky above Alista, the capital of Russia's southern republic of Kalmykia. Some witnesses described the lights as a triangle of rotating circles, while others described the lights as looking like two circles rotating clockwise and counterclockwise. The lights reportedly appeared every 10 days during the month of December. But local journalists think the lights are simply spotlights over a shopping center, though they are not sure. We've reported several stories from Kalmykia in the past, primarily due to the former president of the republic, Kirsan Ilyamzanov, who claims to have met with extraterrestrials back in 1997. And Ilyamzanov is in the process of writing a book about his experience. Mm -hmm. Ilyamzanov. Ilyamzanov. See, I can say it now, but not all the time, and I've been practicing. But you really got that name down real good, Ilyamzanov. Well, I think you have uh, Kalmykia down better than I do. Yeah, I Kalmykia. To... I love to say that. Argentina's military is going to record and investigate UFOs, UFO sightings. The Commission for the Investigation of Aerospace Phenomena is in the process of being formed by Argentina's Air Force. The Argentine Air Force already documents UFO sightings, but this new commission will include reports from meteorologists, air traffic controllers, and civilian pilots. Yeah, this is even more exciting. This is one of the stories like France or something. This is more exciting than a lot of these countries coming out and saying, oh, here's some files. We didn't think much of them. Or like the UK, pretty much putting out some files, some of them very extraordinary and saying, oh, you know, this isn't real. But Argentina is, is saying that they have a real concern and they're putting together a board to actually investigate UFOs are going to do actual You're absolutely right. This is something that's happening now. It's current, and they are going to investigate these sightings. Yep, confirmed with their PR. Um, even Antonio uh, wrote a story for our website where he confirmed with the Argentinian Air Force uh, press department. Yep, that's right. Yeah, do go, do go to openminds.tv and check out that article by Antonio Hunez. Here's an interesting story that you brought to my attention today, Alejandro, sort of an inter entertainment story. The UK trio Muse wants to be the first band to perform in space. In an interview with UK newspaper The Sun, the band has stated that they plan to speak with Sir Richard Branson, head of Virgin Galactic, about the possibility of performing aboard a future Virgin Galactic flight. Yeah, that's exciting. When I read that, I thought, that's genius. And now is the time to jump on this because it's possible... They even said, we don't know how we're going to get an audience out there. But you know what? Don't worry about that. Just get it down that you were the first people to rock in space. 
take your guitars, take an acoustic, and do a little acoustic jam just for each other. They were even commenting that their setup is so complex and just over the top, yeah. they were going to have to figure out how to scale back to be able to get all their gear in yeah, the space. Yeah, because they're super electro and electronic and all of this stuff. But how cool. Who's That's the the race that I'm excited about. Now we've gotten in space. The X, X race is done. You know, now we have these companies that can go to space. But who is going to be the first band to, to rock a concert in space? That's awesome. Just to play. I'm, I almost want, like, uh, um, who are the German guys that did uh, those cool anime videos? That's oh, something man. Alejandro would know. <laughs> yeah, I know, and I can't remember right now. Well, call in. If you know the German band who did the animations <laughs> of the guys rocking in space, Call in and we'll send you a free video of Volume 1 of Open Minds Investigates. You're a funny guy. Let me close out the news with a, a photo, a story about a photo. An interesting photo was taken near Bridport, England last Tuesday. The photographer was shooting the setting sun with his iPhone's camera. When he was saving the pictures to his computer, he noticed a strange object in the sky. He thought that it might be the moon, but the moon wouldn't have been in that particular position in the sky at that time. Some who viewed the photo speculated that the object was simply a reflection of a light in a room behind the photographer. But according to the photographer, that's impossible because he was outside in a field when he snapped the photo. Oh, I know. I saw that. Yeah, that was obviously out someone out in the field. I mean, it's possible it to the moon like they thought, but um, it's an interesting picture. Lens flare is, is one of the, the more likely that um, could be too, candidates. Yeah. Uh, Especially outside when it's cold, if you got fog on your lens. And the iPhone cameras do funny things sometimes. Yeah. But it does. When it's zoomed in, it looks like a, a lampshade with a light in it. It did. And normally I would say, you know what, they probably got it. But they look, they were clearly outdoors in that picture. So right. that's probably not it. Because that happens a lot, you mm -hmm. know, with these photos when you're indoor. You have to be careful about that. Yeah. But. It's a cool photo. It's mm -hmm. It's interesting for sure. Be sure to check out these stories and more at openminds.tv, your source for UFO-related news. I'm Jason McClellan, your Open Minds news correspondent, and you've been briefed. Back to you, Alejandro. Thank you, Jason. So interesting news out there, and I'm not kidding. I remember the name of the band now. That's electronic music because it's this, there's these animation videos where they have this adventure in space, this band. Uh, they're like the Japanese anime, and I remember the name of the band, but I'm not going to say it. If you... Give us a call. We're like 1-800-UFO-0110, and, uh, or you, you send us an email, the first to do that, and name this band. We will. We'll send you a free DVD, which is a good thing to mention. Uh, we did put together a DVD with some of our investigations. Um, oh, one eight seven seven ufo 110 is the number. I repeat, one eight seven seven ufo 110 uh, but this DVD with some of our investigations expanded. I mean, you can see some of these investigations on our YouTube uh, or on our website and our videos. But we've expanded those and put this whole thing together in a whole package where we have five different cases that we put together, some exclusive footage from Roswell and exclusive interviews that we've done on a, a variety of topics. So it's a pretty cool DVD, and you can go purchase that right now in our store but I'm going to give you a, a clue, people. Wait a couple days because it's going to go on sale. You're going to see a message on. Don't tell anybody I told you about this sale on the DVD. But uh, it's a very cool DVD. You're going to like it. A lot of fun. Some of the other stories from the website. Oh, no. Somebody chatted me an answer, I think, but I can't read it because sometimes the chat does that and it's all like weird characters. So, Del Pittman, try again, try to change your font, and maybe I can read it. But some of the other stories going on, oh, that's so weird. Someone said, I think the band is Godzilla, but that's not true. But right before the show, I was singing the Godzilla theme song, and we were listening to it. Oh, and then there's someone else, me laughing, Chariot, who's really close. Oh, guys, you're almost there. But yeah, this Argentina story we wrote. Sure, other people have, have mentioned some things about Argentina and about the Air Force doing some investigations. However, 
we've got the most um, researched story on Argentina out there. So check it out. Antonio, of course, has a vast knowledge of South America and all of the ufology that goes on down there. So we put some history in there and some of the really cool sightings that they've had in Argentina. And like I said, he contacted the Air Force himself, the press department, and was able to confirm some of this. So uh, read our story. That's a, it's a really good one. Uh, we've also got all the other stories that Jason talked about on here. And just today, we posted a story on um, an Argentina UFO photograph that was taken in 1974. A pretty cool photograph. It comes from the Wendell Stevens archives, which we dive into and we're scanning and we're putting on the Internet for you all. Uh, so that you can, um, you know, see all of that stuff that he collected. And this is this really interesting photograph from 1974, I thought, since Argentina is such a big deal right now. You guys would want to check that out. And I want to mention this real quick. Another thing to check out on the website that's going to be brand new tomorrow is a resource tab. So now we're going to have a tab because we have a lot of cool stuff that we want to get out there. And instead of photos, you're going to see a tab that says resources. Under this tab, you're going to be able to look at the photos. There'll be a link to our YouTube, but there'll also be a link to the Wendell Stevens archives. So you can go click that and see all of the stories that we put up uh, of his archives. And, and that'll populate itself when we continue to put stories up like we did today. And you'll also be able to see some of the memorials. But we have more coming. We have exclusive documents. Um, some of these documents have never been posted on the Internet before. Dozens and dozens of them that we're going to be getting up onto the Internet. So check out that resources tab. We'll tell you more about when we post stuff on the radio show, and we'll write stories and send out emails on that as well. So, but without further ado, let's get to our spectacular guest today, and that is the one and only Mr. Travis Walton. Travis, are you there? I'm here. Yay. How you doing? All right. Good. I'm getting really excited about the conference coming up here. Um excited to oh, see yeah. you again. I'm, I'm, I'm getting emails from people from all over that are planning on attending. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And like I told people, you know, it's a chance to get to meet you. Um, which to me, to you, that might not be exciting. But to me, it was when I first met you in It'll be exciting to a lot of the other people out there. So let's start uh, talking about uh, your experience. And I guess for those who don't know much about it, uh, maybe we'll talk about um, where it was and when it was. Uh, well, uh, it was right up here in northern Arizona uh, back in uh, 1975. It was November 5th. Uh, I was working in the woods with a crew of six other men. And, um, now, we were, in the in the movie, you know, there's this, they show you in, like, this really heated kind of um, relationship that you had with one of your coworkers who came with you uh, that evening. Was that true? I mean, was there someone that, I mean, you guys were really going at it or, or didn't like each other? Well, um, we had our moments. There were, you know, it's just like any crew of guys. We weren't a, a bunch of buddies, you know. Yeah. We were just people who were together for a job and right. our differences at time. And, uh, you know, there'd been fights between some of the other guys on the crew at different times. But, uh, you know, Basically, it was just a crew of guys that were there for the purpose of uh, of work. So, you know, a lot a lot of people, you know, expect uh, were shocked that the crew wasn't more heroic. You know, when I was hit, but mm -hmm. uh, it's perfectly understandable. You know, even had we been buddies, that uh, you know, them seeing what had happened to me and thinking that it had killed me, it was completely understandable that they would, uh, you know, take right. off because. They were next. Right, exactly. I mean, you never know how you're going to react to something until it happens. And um, yeah, I know. And a lot of people, 
a lot of people imagine they would be real heroic, you know, right. they would go out and, and save somebody. But, mm-hmm. you know, under the circumstances, it was, it was a very terrifying experience. And, um, well, so let's know, get I, into I, uh, Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, let's get into that then. So you all leave work, and uh, I guess you carpooled, so you had a truckload of, of, of people. And, uh, yeah, it was a, a, a double cab truck, you know, it was big enough to hold all seven of us, and we we hadn't been driving very long. See, in the movie, it it kind of gave the impression that, you know, it was a long drive home and everybody was getting kind of drowsy, but the truth was, we'd just barely phys- been physically working hard, and, and, you know, so we weren't sleepy. Our minds were, you know, pretty keen because of the recent physical exercise, you know? Right. And so then you're you're going home and it gets dark and, and that's when uh, you spotted something. Yeah, you know, at first it, it wasn't all that alarming, but uh, the the longer we looked, the stranger it was. Um, it well, was deer hunting season, and we'd been hearing a few shots in the distance, so it wasn't, you know, it's much of a stretch to think. Well, what the light was probably from maybe some deer hunters camped out there, but. But then, you know, it became more evident as we longer we looked that um, that the light was coming from higher than where the crest of the ridge would have been. And, uh, you know, like I said, not all that alarming at first, but still something definitely out of place. You don't normally see a light off in the woods. You know, it's usually pretty dark. And, mm-hmm. and so, you know, we were... It wasn't like we all immediately started talking about it either. It's just kind of everybody... Who, uh, you know, was kind of divided up into little conversations that were going on, and then one by one, everybody kind of quit talking and kept looking in the same direction. And then people were saying, well, "What's what, what, you know?" Wondering what that was. So, um, so then you but, guys you know, decided to go check it out. Yeah, well, you could see ahead where the light mm-hmm. was breaking through uh, and uh, uh, washing across the road ahead. So we knew when we got up there, we'd be able to see the source of the light. <laughs> and uh, oh, so you didn't have to go off course to go actually check it out. It was on. Uh, it was just off the path that you were headed on your way home, anyway. Yeah. Uh, so as soon as we got to where that light was, uh, we could see the the uh, craft hovering there, and it was unmistakable. And um, um, I think it was Alan Dallas yelled out, it's a, it's a flying saucer. And, uh, you know, like anybody needed to say, because it was so clear. This is less than 100 feet away, you know. This huge metallic disc hovering there below the treetops and outlined against the sky and uh, giving off of this very strange light and making this... Uh, really weird sort of a very complex sound Mm -hmm. really high and really low um, off the range of human hearing on both hands so and then I think the movie title came from how you described this craft that it was like a fire in the sky yeah you know even before we got up to it we were thinking that maybe it was a forest fire, but it was just kind of a passing thought because, you know, we have driven through the woods and come upon a tree that had been hit by lightning that was burning. You know, you stop and put the fire out. So, but, you know, it had been clear dry weather, and and so that was quickly, you know, dismissed as a possible source of the light. And, uh, and, And, you know, when we described it as looking like molten metal, we were talking about like metal from a blast furnace, you know, that's almost white hot, you know, uh, kind of a really brilliant uh, gl- uh, yellowish glow. And so, you know, in the movie, they made it look like molten lava, kind of red, uh, and actually a cooler color uh, than it was. And, uh, but that wasn't the way it was. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was really easy to see distinctly the surface of it. It wasn't so bright that you couldn't look directly at it. Um, it was metallic all over, but parts of it were glowing. 
um, panels. Uh, but um, everything was smooth. There wasn't any like seams or anything. It was it was almost like glass. The whole thing was perfectly smooth. And, yeah, the uh, picture that I've I've seen that you had put together, I think uh, Mike Rogers, one of the other witnesses, had. Yeah, it looks almost like it's a mirrored. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's kind of like you know when you when lights coming in through the through the the window and and you're looking at the television, which of course is giving off light, but you can still see things reflected in the screen. So you could see the surrounding trees reflected in the surface of this craft. At the same time, it was giving off uh, uh, a glow that kind of made everything around close to it look really kind of weird, um, a soft sort of a glow that just kind of made things look odd. So people but, were uh, getting pretty scared, but how were you feeling? Well, I was scared, but, you know, I I thought it was going to take off before I got very close. So, you know, I was really curious to see it uh, up close and, you know, maybe a little bit of showing off. Uh, in going so close to it, but I regretted that pretty quickly. I, I was, I started out moving rapidly towards it, but then when I saw that it wasn't taking off, um, see, you know, when we're we're riding home in the woods, you know, you'll see a, a deer or a bear or something, and you'll call for the rest of the crew to look. And very often, before they can even turn and look, it's gone before. Uh, they get a chance to see it so that was kind of my thinking that it would be gone before i got that close but the closer i got and it wasn't going anywhere and and the more alarm the, the crew were, was getting you know they started yelling at me to get back in the truck and swearing at me and <laughs> oh. why'd you decide to get out just to get a closer look yeah i was curious to, you know i just wanted to see it before it zipped off and uh um, the, uh, Steve Pierce, he was saying that Alan Dallas was, you know, ducking down on the floorboard and, uh, Wayne, uh, Dwayne, Dwayne Smith, uh, put it was, he said he kissed his knees, but, you know, I guess he was trying to get down below the sill of the, the truck, you know, for a little better safety. Uh, but, uh, it, it, it was really pretty scary for, for everybody. Mm -hmm. including me you know i i was trying not to act scared but you know when it suddenly started to move and started to get louder i i just <clears throat> pardon me i um dove for cover there was a, a log sticking up um and out of this pile of logging debris that they piled up there and i got down behind that and uh see as i was approaching you know i, I finally got close enough to where I was looking up at a pretty steep angle, uh, probably steeper than 45 degrees. I know, I'm not sure, but, um, the, uh, and then when it started to move and it started to rise up and, and it was kind of unsteady it, as it rose. And then, then the guy of the crew were really, you know, in a panic and, and yelling at me to get away from there. But, you know, I didn't really need to be told. I was figuring out, you know, how am I going to get myself out of this situation? Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, it didn't take long to figure out, just jump up and run back to the truck. But when I raised up at that point, you know, I was closest to the craft. So, you know, maybe that triggered something, whatever happened. As soon as I straightened up, I was just felt this numbing shock, kind of like a, I'd been hit real hard uh, physically or, or maybe electrocuted. Um, Alan, uh, not Alan, but Dwayne Smith later became an electrician, and he said to him it sounded like high voltage. Hmm. But, you know, in one of the police interviews, uh, one of the men said it, it um, looked like a long blue flame, but whatever it was, it was extremely powerful. You know, uh, Steve Pierce said that he, he, he thinks it threw me like 20 feet. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so some of the other crewmen say it was like 10 feet, but Steve swears it's 20 because he's out there now talking about this. I hadn't heard from him in like 30 years, and he suddenly um, started writing. Hmm. But uh, anyway, it was pretty violent, and uh, you know how Hollywood likes to embellish things in right. this case. They've actually kind of played it down. Really? Uh, in the movie, it, it kind of looks like uh, like a spotlight came on, and, and the actors kind of held there for a second and then tossed back. But 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 the crew said it was more like a, I'd stepped on a landmine, like a, a grenade had just gone off and just blew me through the air. And they say the way my body tumbled and the way I hit the ground without defending myself from the fall that they figured it killed me, you know, that they actually yelled at it, each other. It killed him. He's dead. They Just like in the spell. movie. Someone yeah. asked the size of the craft in the movie. Was that similar to um, real life? Well, it's kind of hard to gauge, mm-hmm. you know, uh, mm-hmm. size even in the movie. Uh, when you're out in the woods, there's not that much of a reference. You know, you don't have anything familiar size objects to compare it to, but just judged on the uh, on the size of the clearing later, you know, we figured maybe 25 feet in diameter, mm-hmm. which isn't real all that huge. But when you see that thing up close and the, uh, feel that powerful sound, it it really had a very imposing sort of a feel to it. And so when this, you know, like you said, like a it was one person said like a blue flame that came out, hit you and you flew. Uh, 20 feet, and that's when your coworker said, "I ah, killed him, and we're out of here." Yeah, yeah. They uh, said they just panicked and took off, nearly wrecked the truck, uh, trying to put some distance between them and and the craft. And and they got up a, a ways, and then they saw uh, some deer hunters, and they went and tried to catch them, hoping that maybe they had some weapons. But mm. you know. I guess they finally came to their senses and calmed down a little bit and, and realized they were going to have to go back and see what happened. And so, you know, you got to give them credit for that because... I think definitely, you know, I think especially, you know, you watch war movies and when something happens, um, uh, you know, when when something as powerful happens as that, uh, I think it's it's brave of them that they, they decided to go back at all right that, that soon. Yeah. And, you know, in the movie they had it where, you know, when Mike pulled over and said, look, you know, this truck's going back and anybody that doesn't want to go can wait here. And uh, anybody who wants to go with me can go. In the movie, Mike went back alone, which is just ridiculous because there's no way that any one of those crews is going to get out and stand alone in the dark out there on that road. Yeah. You know, it might have been pretty apprehensive about returning, but. But, you know, they all went back. Mm -hmm. And so I got to give them credit for that because they had every excuse to to keep going uh, and straight to the sheriff. But um, how long was it before uh, they went back? Was was it very much? It wasn't very long. They said it was, you know, just just long enough to run up there and try to catch those hunters. And then when they couldn't, they turned around and went back. And they thought they saw the light moving off through the trees. And so. That made it a little easier, but they were still pretty scared getting back to the site. They could see where the truck had peeled out when they when they took off, and so they found the spot. And uh, they said they were pretty pretty apprehensive about getting out. They only had one flashlight, so they were all, you know, six of them huddled around this one flashlight and and, and searching. Uh, and uh, where my body had landed, uh, you know, there was nothing there. So they called out, and they were, you know, continually being scared by the by the moon uh, because it was kind of similar in color, uh, catching sight of it through the trees, you know, as the craft. But you know, they were it was pretty intense. And, and at one point, you know, Mike broke down and cried. And of course, right now. Uh, Steve Pierce is making a big deal out of that, you know, because he felt so bad about, you know, my first book um, when I when I wrote about, you know, he was one of the ones that was still crying when they went to the sheriff. Um, he didn't like that at all. Oh you know, no! He, some of his relatives were teasing him about it or something. Mm. You know, here we are 
35 years later, and he's working on a book, and his main issue is he wasn't the only one crying, and, and <laughs> right. Alan Powell was so scared. And, you know, I don't think anybody cares. Mm-hmm. But, you know, to him, it's the biggest issue out there is that, that you know, he wasn't that scared, and the other guys were crying too. And, you know, I don't, I don't feel, you know, that any of those guys have anything to be ashamed of in right. how they handled it, you know? It's, what? it's yeah, you see someone, what you think is someone being killed right in front of you. Um, yeah. It's very traumatic. Yeah, it was very traumatic, you know, and and uh, I suppose probably all of us had cried about it in, in one way or another uh, since it happened. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's just. It's just one of those things you have to you have to deal with, and mm-hmm. yeah, we're a bunch of tough loggers, and you know, I don't like to emphasize that part of it, but you know, it it speaks to the intensity of what we experienced. Mm-hmm. So you know, they went back to town, and they were um, arguing about what to do. Alan Dallas didn't want to go to the authorities yet. You know, he he preferred just to get some friends and some guns and and go back and make a search, and then if they couldn't find me maybe you know then go to the sheriff but you know um ken and and mike figured no because you know if travis is never found and it's going to look bad if we don't report it right away so you know they were of the opinion that they should should report it right away so they did they called the um the local uh uh deputy and he called the sheriff and and uh, he brought another deputy with him and and so you know, the the sheriff interviewed the men right there, and, and uh, like I said, you know, some of the guys were still crying, and, it, and it, the lawmen were really impressed with the fact that something really serious had happened. Mm-hmm. But being, being lawmen, they figured that uh, they were suspicious right away. We found out later that, that, that these guys had killed me, mm-hmm. that there'd been some kind of fight at work, and and that they were just making up a crazy story to cover up for why nobody was ever going to see Travis again, you know? Right. So, but, you know, people ask him, did, did it look like they were drunk or something, you know? And the sheriff says that, you know, he sat in the truck with him and he interviewed him right after it happened. And, and you know, he didn't spot anything. And, you know, he's got a long, long career in law enforcement. He says, I, I didn't see anything and I was looking. Yep. So, um, so then, uh, so they go back, and, and I think there's even a manhunt where they're looking for you for five days, and and yeah, in the movie, the sheriff didn't want to go out that night, but uh, in actuality, he took part of the crew with him, and they made another search, went back out there, mm-hmm. and again, that that took courage. Of course, it took a little less courage because the, <laughs> the sheriff and his men were armed. Yeah, but uh, still. You know, I don't really think conventional weapons would have helped them too much. Yeah. But still, you know, they did, they did go back and they did try to rescue me, and I, I give them credit for that. But they were unable to find anything that night, and so the sheriff organized a, a massive manhunt. Uh, he got the search and rescue parties and volunteers from the Forest Service and civilians. And, uh, you know, there were people on horseback and four-wheel drive vehicles. Uh, they basically, you know, uh, spaced the people out over a wide area and moved through the woods in unison so that, you know, each searcher was in sight of another searcher. And they just, you know, crisscross and comb the area that way in a very organized way and uh, were unable to find, you know, any kind of sign of any kind. Uh, the tracking dogs were unable to find anything beyond the clearing. Um, now, uh, um, on the credits of the movie, there's a credit for uh, Geiger Counterman, <clears throat> and uh, uh, that scene wasn't actually used in the movie. Hmm. Um, they they didn't want to put anything in the movie that uh, weighed too heavily in favor of this actually happening. They they wanted to preserve for the audience the idea that maybe these guys had killed me, you know, mm, for the suspense so, of the movie. Yeah. So they sense. took that out and threw in some clues against it, like that tabloid in the truck, which never happened. And, uh, so, 
you know, even the thing about Mike going back alone didn't happen. It was just uh-huh. all to, to sh- uh, put doubt on it and, you know, who killed who and, you know, what might have happened here. So there were some other scenes that were shot that weren't used. Uh, you know, Hollywood has to kind of sex things up, you know. Before you yeah. had come back, um, was it true that the, the police did, then did start to uh, suspect foul play? Oh, yeah. Uh, they were uh, being accused uh, more and more openly. Uh, during the search, one of the uh, uh, Forest Service volunteers walked up to one of the crewmen and grabbed his shirt front and jerked him up close and said, all right, where'd you hide the body? Because, hmm. you know, that was kind of the attitude a lot of the searchers had, that that they were mad that they were even being put through this because they figured these guys had killed me and, ah. and just a cover-up. So. But that's that's when the crew said, you know, we're not lying. We'll take sodium pentothal or lie detector test, anything you want. So uh, the sheriff heard about that and arranged uh, for a lie detector test. He brought in the best in the state, um, probably one of the best examiners in the country at that time was Cy Gilson. He was the uh, state police polygraph examiner. He'd been uh, doing all the work for the Department of Public Safety and law enforcement in the state. And so... Um, the men uh, went down to the county courthouse, uh, which was also the jail, and uh, uh, and they all passed, the, right? Yeah, they all passed. Uh, they announced at first that one of them was inconclusive, but we got a copy of the file that showed that you know privately they had said that even Alan was basically telling the truth, mm-hmm. and. Uh, so, you know, but that didn't stop the the disbelievers, you know. Even after I was returned, you know, people were just desperate to explain this away any way they could. Mm-hmm. So it was just one theory after another that just didn't right. make any sense. So then I guess um, getting to your experience, uh, what was the next thing you remember after being uh, zapped? Well, um I regained consciousness kind of slowly, <laughs> and uh, I was in a lot of pain, and I, I didn't even remember how I got there at first. Um, I was in and out of consciousness, and then, you know, I it kind of gradually came to me that I was lying on some kind of a raised operating table or gurney of some kind, and I remembered approaching that object. But I didn't think that I was on board. At first, I thought, you know, there was this light above me. And I was just thinking that maybe I'd got hurt somehow and uh, that the crew had taken me to the hospital. So I thought I was in like an emergency room. And I was having trouble seeing and having trouble breathing. So it was was so intense that I kind of like was in and out for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I could hear the sounds of movement around me and they, they had this um, device across my chest um, but you know I couldn't get my eyes to focus very well uh, the, the light even though it wasn't all that bright was painful and I, I had a lot of pain in my head and chest but I could kind of make out the forms of people standing around me, moving around. And then when I could finally focus, I I could see that this wasn't a doctor. This was this creature standing over me. And I just flipped out. I just instantly figured out where I was and what the situation was. Uh, I knew I was in a bunch of trouble. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I just flipped out. I just completely, I guess I just kind of went crazy with fear. Mm -hmm. Now, and these creatures, uh, I think you describe them as pretty similar to uh, just slightly different than uh, what people usually see. These these things with big heads, uh, with large eyes, um, small bodies, and and they were wearing uh, some sort of jumpsuit. Yeah. Um. This was, uh, you know, there weren't a lot of such reports back in those days. So mm-hmm. 
Uh, I don't think anybody would come up with the term grays or anything like that, so I don't call them grays. Matter of fact, you know, I've kind of accepted the term spacecraft and alien, but to tell you the truth, I, I don't know where they were from, uh, mm-hmm. you know? I don't, you know, I, like to, I, I try to stick to what I, what I saw, uh, but knowing where they come, that's a, that's a big leap because they didn't tell me. Um, I just flipped out, and I tried to knock them away from me, but I was so weak I could hardly move. I lifted my arm and went to hit them away, but it was more of a push than anything. And it, it, it fell back surprisingly easy. It was a lot lighter than I thought it would be. And so you actually shoved one of them. How many of them were in the room? There were three of them. Okay. And, and, and he kind of fell back into the other one, and I rolled away from him off the table, and that thing they had on my chest fell off. But I was just, you know, riveted on them, and they came around the table like they were coming towards me, and I staggered back until I hit something, and I was up against the kind of a shelf or a workbench there against the wall, and I looked quickly to see what it was, and there was just some instruments, various things scattered out there, and um, I just grabbed for the biggest thing I could find to, mm-hmm. to fin them off with. And so I lashed out at them with it and uh, started screaming threats. And so they stopped. And, and uh, you know, they were, they were small creatures, uh, hairless. But these, they had these huge eyes that just seemed to look right into me. Mm-hmm. And it was very, it was actually the most disturbing point of all my memories of the entire experience is, you know, the way they looked into me in a way that, I don't know, it's really hard to describe what that effect that had on me. But, uh, and you saw some seen, sort of pupils. Yeah, it, it, it was the, like a pupil and an eyelid. They hmm. I actually blink. And not simultaneously, but, you know, I saw them blink. Hmm. I was thinking how I was going to fight my way past them because I just wanted to put more distance between me and them. But the door was on the other side of them. But before I could make a move, uh, they just turned and left. Did they try to communicate with you at all that you know of? Unless that stare had something to do with trying to reach into me in some way but you know recently i thought of an idea about why that might not have been working i used to think that maybe it was just my complete hysteria that kept them from being able to do anything like telepathy but you know what if what if the fact that i was hit with that beam caused some kind of an injury in my head Mm -hmm. that that, that kind of interfered with their ability to control me. May, as a matter of fact, maybe that was why I came to and regained consciousness. That, that probably wasn't even anticipated by them. Mm-hmm. So maybe it had something to do with an injury that kept them from being able to to, to keep me knocked out or whatever. But, you know, it's just speculation. Yeah. But uh, they left, and they moved kind of... It seemed quicker, uh, real kind of like a scurrying sort of motion. Hmm. You know, people ask me, did they move? Did they move like robots? You know, but I, I really don't think that if you could make uh, something technologically that could function in place of a being, that you would see anything like something jerking or making a whirring noises or something. You know, mm-hmm. was it kind uh, of a scurry? They were quick. Yeah, they were quick mm-hmm. and light and, you know, um, yeah, kind of a scurrying motion. Mm-hmm. So they ran out of the room, and uh, this this room that you were in, of course, in the movie, uh, the craft is all, you know, messy, and there's stuff all over the place. Was, was it like yeah, that? Yeah, they had it looking all organic, but it was actually yeah. very mechanical and sterile and rather featureless you know Uh i didn't even see screws or bolts now you know it's possible i overlooked a lot of detail because i was in a total hysterical state Mm -hmm. and panic 
but it it seemed rather featureless to me. Yeah. And uh, they had gone out down this little passageway uh, to the right, so I went to the left. But I I took off, you know, with this fear that they were coming after me. Uh But the passageway curved so tightly to the right that I couldn't see far enough behind me to see if they were after me or even far enough ahead to see if I was running into something worse. (laughs) Right. So I was really torn about that little escape uh, that I was making there. But I was just looking for a way out. And uh, I just thought, you know, I guess subconsciously, I wasn't thinking too clearly, but I was thinking if I could just open a door that I would be able to jump out and jump to the ground and be back in the woods. You know, oh, which, gotcha. Uh, so, you know, it's probably a good thing I didn't find a door to open. <laughs> yeah. No, no telling where it was. Right. And, you know, that could have got, had serious consequences. Right. But that's what I was uh, thinking not too clearly, you know, uh, in, in doing. But um, I came to uh, a doorway, and there was a little room, round room there, and and uh, this little room had some rectangles on the opposite wall that I figured were probably doors, and so I wanted to get over there and see if them were, uh, any of those would would open. Now, when I figured out later what the lay of the craft probably was, those doors uh, probably wouldn't have led to the outside anyway. But I was totally disoriented as yeah. where I was. You're just scrambling. And, yeah. But when I moved into this room, it it darkened, and I could see points of light all around, the floor, the wall, the ceiling, and uh, that was kind of uh, uh, gave me pause, you know, about going any further, but then I, I realized it had something to do with my position because, you know, the closer I was to the walls, the less you could see that. But when you hmm. were near the center of the room, you could see it very clearly, these points of light. So that was either some kind of like a a map or a viewing screen of where it actually was. So you felt these points of light were like a star field? Uh, yeah, stars. like maybe a planetarium type projection. Uh-huh. Either, you know, some way of viewing through the walls of the craft where it was or, or something projected there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know where that would be projected from because I never, you know, my form didn't seem to create any shadows or anything, Mm -hmm. but, um, I was, I was afraid that somebody would be in the chair. There was a chair in the center of the room and I avoided that at first, but I wanted to get to those rectangles and see if I could open the door. And uh, I, I couldn't find any button or doorknob or anything. So I thought maybe the buttons on the chair might open a door. So I tried pushing some of those buttons, which was pretty reckless. But, uh, you know, I was desperate. And, yeah. And, what can you lose but, at this point? Yeah. But, you know, most of the buttons, unfortunately, didn't seem to do anything. What did these buttons look like? Like a button on a keyboard or... or? Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, real flush, smooth, not raised or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, just you know, technology like you might find uh, on Earth somewhere. You know, mm-hmm. the screen. I didn't touch the screen, so I didn't know if it was touch sensitive or anything like that. But. Uh, some of the buttons made the lines move. There was these straight lines, little segments, um, and they would just kind of change angle and, and move a little bit. But no numbers or letters or anything I recognize that way. But the the one that there was a big lever there, and I moved it, and it moved the star pattern. Mm-hmm. And that was really disorienting because, you know, these, these stars were all around me. So that was kind of like my visual reference. And I was I was unsteady on my feet. I was already a little bit 
you know, right. tips. And so that kind of made me uh, dizzy, and I resolved not to mess with that one anymore. Right. But I was thinking about pushing another button, thinking I would open a, a door when something caught my attention from the door that I'd come through. And I turned, and there was a human standing there. At least I thought he was a human. And, uh, you know, I, this was the most welcome sight to me at this point because I, I thought I, that somebody was there to rescue me, you know, that this was some kind of police or military or, you know, something, uh, NASA maybe. What were his clothes but, like? Well, he was wearing blue coveralls, mm -hmm. but no insignia, not, not under no flags or anything like Did that. Did the coveralls look strange at all? Were they different from maybe what an yeah. Air Force? Yeah, it was definitely not something that, you know, I wasn't thinking too clearly, but, you know, mm -hmm. it was much more close-fitting than you would uh, see in a Air Force jumpsuit. But, mm -hmm. He had this helmet on, and I, so I was just yelling, babbling and yelling questions, and, and he wasn't answering. But I thought because of the helmet that maybe he couldn't hear me or couldn't talk with it on. Hmm. And so when he wanted me to go with him, uh, I was only too glad to go, you know, figuring he was going to take me out of this place. And the pictures, uh, that looks like the helmet was completely clear, like it was made out of a clear plastic or something. Well, I think it was probably frosted or maybe fogged up on the back. Okay. Backside behind him. But, uh, so I went with him, and he took me out of there. And through so what I take was probably a, an airlock. And I don't know if the craft was there the whole time or if it was just there at this point, but when the other door slid back... Um, it was so much brighter, and the air was so much easier to breathe. Hmm. It was really quite a relief. It was um, the light was much more like sunlight too. And uh, he took me out of the craft, which was was parked inside of this huge uh, room, kind of an airplane hangar kind of a thing, because the ceiling was had these translucent panels that you know sloped down into one wall so the so the, the room was shaped kind of like a quarter of a cylinder turned on its side hmm. and the ceiling and one wall were giving off light i don't know whether these were light fixtures that gave off light that was like sunlight or if it was just panels and sunlight was shining on them um I tried to look around, but he seemed to be in a hurry, and he was leading me along, and I was stumbling because I was still pretty weak and unsteady on my feet. And you said it, but, it seemed like a hangar, so it must have been very large. Yeah, it was very large. It was quite – the ceiling was quite high, and there was some other craft in there, disc-shaped craft. Uh, I didn't see any airplanes or anything – conventional craft but there were these other craft were more rounded and sort of more chrome or reflective like mm -hmm. but i didn't really get a chance to look that much so i don't know how many there were exactly but um he hurried me out of this room in this hangar down a hallway and uh I was getting pretty anxious about why I wasn't getting any information, any answers, you know. But it really put my mind at ease quite a bit to be in his company and right. away from the creatures and out of that uh, humid, dark place. But um, then he took me into this room, and there were some other people dressed like him, except they weren't wearing helmets. Hmm. So I thought, you know, that maybe now they could hear me and they could answer my questions. Well, that's kind of an exaggeration about my thinking because it wasn't all that clear. I was really <laughs> kind of uh, foggy-headed and, and just full of panic. Yeah. And so, you know, when I repeated these questions, I was basically yelling and screaming like a maniac. But uh, he left me with them, and they started to try to put me down on the table 
And that's when I got suspicious about was I really rescued and uh, were these, you know, were they there to help me at all, you know? So I started to try to resist, which didn't do me a whole lot of good because I was still so weak. And here you so, you couldn't hear anything. So did you get a a sense they were trying to communicate with you at all? Were you getting or frustrated that no, they wouldn't? Because see, they were close enough. They had a, a tight grip on me, and uh -huh. I was struggling. Uh, I was too weak to pull loose. But there were three of them, and they were so much stronger than me. And um, but when I yell, I could see a little wince in their face. Hmm. So I know they could hear me, but they didn't seem the slightest bit inclined to answer me or, you know, show much emotion or anything. Right. Uh, um, I was able to jerk uh, one hand free and get it under the edge of the mask. Uh, they put this mask over my face. It was kind of like an oxygen mask which I think was, you know, something designed to knock me out because even though I got my finger under it, I just blacked out just that fast. I don't think I fainted. I think it was the mask that mm -hmm. did it. But uh, I just went out real fast. And um, I don't know, you know, where this conscious period was, mm -hmm. you know, during this experience whether it was at the beginning, in the middle, or at the end. But oh, right. The, the, next thing, the next thing I remembered was waking up, and I came to pretty quickly. I was still in quite a bit of pain in my head and chest, but not nearly as bad as before. But it was cold air, and I could tell it was outside. And I was lying face down with my head on my arm, and there was a light above me, and I looked to see where the light was coming from. And I looked up, and uh, I could see the bottom of this craft uh, hovering there. And it seemed like I could feel warmth coming from it. But just as soon as I put my eyes to where the light was coming from, it went out. So I don't know whether the light was like propulsion or, or the, a light fixture or hatch closing. But it was just hovered there for a second in the dark. I could see the everything reflected in this silvery hull before it just shot up into the sky. Just was gone from sight so fast. It was just incredible. You'd think it would just break the sound barrier or something, but mm -hmm. it was basically silent. It, it kind of stirred the air a little bit, and the leaves and the, and the branches moved. But the next thing, I, I just went from looking up into the sky and seeing that nothing but stars to looking around and, and I recognized where I was. Mm -hmm. I was standing um, beside the highway outside the town nearest where this had happened. And unlike the movie, you had your clothes on also. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one of those scenes that they filmed where – you know, I, I I stumble upon these lovers in a car, and they're naked, and I'm naked, and then I start screaming, and they start screaming. <laughs> it was a horrible, horrible scene that they uh, <laughs> cut, and I'm glad they did. But uh, anyway, I, I I'm still wearing the same clothes I've been wearing at work, and uh, but it was cold, and but you know I, I wasn't really thinking about that. I was thinking about getting some help. I ran down um, across the first bridge, and the first building I came to was lit lit inside, and there was uh, smoke coming out of the chimney. And so I pounded on the door, and nobody came. Hmm. So I ran on down across the next bridge, and I came to um, a service station, and there was some a row of phone booths there. And I went in and picked up the receiver, and it was dead. And I, that was Great. really a sinking feeling. But I went into the next one, the middle one, and it worked. But um, you don't have to have, or didn't at that time, uh, a coin to talk to the operator. So I was able to make a collect call to my family. And uh, 
Firstly, they took it to be some kind of a prank. Oh, really? They started, yeah, they started to hang up on me. Wow. And I screamed, no, it's me, it's me. And and I, for something, and I was able to convince them. And they said, okay. Um, and my brother-in-law said, I'll get your brother. And I'll, I'll come and get you. We'll come At get this you. time, did you have a sense yet as to how long you had been gone? No, I thought it was the same night. So when they uh -huh. picked me up, and that was kind of weird, too, because I collapsed there, and it seemed like hardly any time before they were there, but it had to be at least 45 minutes. Anyway, they picked me up and put me in the truck, and I tried to tell them about what happened, and it was it was just so horrible. I just kept breaking down. Uh -huh. Somehow in the conversation, it, you know, it came out about how much time had gone by because I said something, you know, that made them understand that I thought this was still the same night. And they said, no, Charles, feel your face. And, and I had this growth of beard, and I looked at my watch, and it had changed the date. And, and man, that, for some reason, really just kind of you know, finished me off, you know? Yeah. And so... One point I, I want to make, or go ahead. Well, you know, it was it was it had been a pretty rough right. time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the family had been getting all these uh, weird calls. You know, that was part of the reason they were going to hang up on me. Is they had a lot of crank calls. But some weird. of the calls sound... Well, you know, this one lady uh, said she was a nurse and she had been working in a hospital. And this old couple had um, had an experience like what I had experienced. But when she came back on shift, the, the couple was gone, the records were gone, and everybody was trying to act like they hadn't been there. So wow. she, was, she was saying, just be careful who gets a hold of him when he gets returned. Wow. And they had a call from a guy that said he was retired CIA that said the same thing. So the family was pretty leery about, um, you know, just taking me off to the sheriff and saying, well, here he is. We found him, you know. <laughs> yeah. It, it, they were, you know, untrusting of the, of uh, the authorities. Oh wow, I had not heard of that part before. Yeah, so rather than taking me right to the sheriff, uh, my brother took me to Phoenix and and tried to get some medical tests done right away. And that was kind of interesting. Uh, there was quite a battery of tests, but first kind of got diverted to some phony ufologist guy that they sort of represented in the movie. Huh. But uh, 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 some uh, rather strange people that weren't who they claimed they were. You know, the guy right. representing himself to be a doctor couldn't do any tests, and but finally got hooked up with the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. They uh, they uh, uh, organized a whole bunch of tests. Uh, so I had uh, EKG, EEG, um, uh, blood tests, urinalysis. Uh, upper body x-rays, a um, whole battery of tests that uh, went on, you know, there was additional tests added later, but one of the one of the things that, you know, uh, people tried to explain it away with right off the bat was that, that it was all a drug hallucination. So that was the reason these blood and urine samples were put through the uh, uh -huh. county medical examiner's drug screen, showed no trace of any drug. And so uh, the same thing with the, the the theory that I'd had a transitory psychosis, that I'd you know temporarily gone insane. Imagine that this had happened to me, and then and then come back to to normal. Right. <laughs> well, um, the, the psychiatric test uh, showed a perfectly normal pattern of scores. Uh, but you know what's really stupid uh, is that all of these theories, and there was another theory that that the hypnotist had led me in mm. during hypnosis to believe that this had happened to me. Yeah. Uh, but none of that squares with how six other men shared my hallucination. Right. You know, nothing the hypnotist could have done to me would have made, had any effect on the rest of the crew. Yeah. The same thing with uh, a transitory psychosis. Did the whole crew have a transitory psychosis? Right. You know, the, did they all hallucinate? You know, right. it's just it, that doesn't it's just work. totally absurd. Nobody asked the question, how, how do seven people have the same 
Delusion. Yeah, yeah before we're done, too, um, I wanted to make sure people got to hear the full story of what really happened on the craft, because that's the main part that's different from the movie. And I also wanted to clear someone's name, because you hear a lot of times it was the director who did it, the right director to change shit, and the director was Tracy Torme, who did not... No, that was... That- that was a screenwriter. He, right. he wrote it. Um, the changes came in later, uh, and I'm not sure who added those changes and, and, or, or asked that they be made. Mm-hmm. But originally, I agreed to do it with the understanding they were going to stay true to the story. And it's only after you know, so each person that becomes involved, another co-producer, uh, the director of the studio, and each person gets um, – creative control to a greater and greater degree mm-hmm. and you know, me least of all I, all right. I never approved those those changes and as a matter of fact the part aboard the craft where they changed things the most wasn't even in the script that i uh, got and so you know i was really pretty disappointed about that mm-hmm. and, and so uh, was tracy wrote, for me right he was very upset about the changes yeah he was and he, he did his best to try to get them to stay with the real story and and he was successful to a certain extent Mm -hmm. but um uh, i'm still happy that you know although we had to give in on those things that that it did allow people to experience the kind of emotion that we went through living through that back because you know people still left the theaters with the same kind of emotional impact Uh you know yeah, and, just you know, the, the like, sheer fear and terror that you did experience while you were on the craft. Yeah. And, you know, there's even a few things where I would have to say it did a better job of of showing how I felt. Mm-hmm. There's this one scene where the actor's face is covered with a membrane and he's struggling to breathe through it. And although that didn't happen at all, you know, if you'd have just showed an actor standing there breathing hard, looking panicked, you wouldn't understand the feeling of suffocation that I had mm. and how that added to the feeling of panic so gotcha. much. Well, thank you. I mean, we're almost out of time already. Of course, uh, a lot of questions and everything. Oh, one quick question. Uh, someone asked in the chat was, did you ever get visited by any government type people? Yeah, there was quite a bit of that uh, on the underhanded, nothing overt, you know, but. Um, Oh, I, I guess I can get into that more if I uh, come and uh, come to the conference. We can yeah. uh, exactly can take, uh, any questions we didn't cover here. We'll tell them, or we'll leave them wanting more. I mean, we got the main part. What's different from the movie? But yes, you'll be at the UFO Congress in February, where people will be able to hear more. And thank you so much for being on the show. We'll definitely have you on again too, so we could get more into some of this other stuff. Yeah, I'll get back with you, Alejandro. All right, thank you so much. I'm excited to see you. And uh, we'll see you in February. It's going to feel like no time, I'm sure, before we're there. Yeah, just a few weeks away. Time flies. It's already 2011. Yep. All right. Well, tell uh, Danny Happy New Year and Happy Holidays for me, and we'll talk to you later. Talk to you later. Thanks. All right. Travis Walton, there's what really happened on the craft, and I think what really happened is so incredibly fascinating uh, i'm sure you all do too and what might have happened and why but it is important to note that tracy torme who is mel torme's son he was the one who directed the movie and he did not want to make those changes either he was very upset about that he wanted to stay true to the story as well so it was the producers these hollywood types we were complaining about earlier in the show who changed stuff and thought it would be more exciting if they made up all this weird stuff with human body parts and everything. But that was not the case at all. But yes, if you uh, thought this story was fascinating and you want to get a, more of a sense of if you feel that it's real or not, you know, come to the conference, ufocongress.com, and come and meet Travis yourself. You'll find that he's a very down-to-earth person, and you'll be able to hear more about this story. Now, next week, we have another spectacular guest who's also a speaker at the conference, and that is Kathleen Martin. She's actually the niece of Betty Hill. And Betty and Barney Hill were the first abduction case that came to the public attention in 1961. Another very fascinating case uh, way back when. She has now written a book on that. Uh, She does speak, talk. She worked for MUFON 
for a period of time. In fact, she graded my UFO uh, investigator test. And she's written some books with Stanton Friedman. So we'll talk to her about that, Kathleen Martin, next week. I'm excited about this one, too. You guys have a wonderful week. That's it for Open Minds this week, your UFO News Authority. And we will talk to you later. Adios, muchachos. We are coming at you, Coast to Coast AM, uh, live from Las Vegas. Uh, our guest uh, is John. for the next half hour is John Lear. He's a retired airline captain, former CIA pilot, son of the famous inventor of the Lear jet. Uh, John has flown over 150 test aircraft. He's won every, every award 
granted by the uh, FAA, holds 18 world speed records, and is the unofficial conspiracy correspondent uh, for me on this program. Uh, We're going to be right back to ask John about a secret submarine base out here in the middle of the desert, as well as about uh, Area 52, Bob Lazar, Element 115, and maybe torture planes. So don't go away. This is Coast to Coast AM. I'm George Knapp, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. I'm George Knapp, your guest host, and I'm joined by John Lear, the one and only. John, before we can jump back to talking, no way to detect it. Shouldn't shouldn't someone have access to that information to be able to say, aha, we see it up there? No. Well, yeah, you can see the um, space stations. There, There's many photos of them uh, filmed that a guy took in Santa Monica. I think they call him uh, Santa Monica John, and that's not me. Uh, and he had a, a telescope that would track satellites and what he did is he followed them and they're amazing satellites i mean and this this stuff is on you can uh, g- you know get it on uh, youtube or above top com. but there's got to be at least 10 different film clips of these huge space stations you know orbiting earth let's go back to bob lazar for a second have you been in touch with bob uh, regarding the uh, the matter i mentioned earlier the uh, the hassle he's been getting from the government about the sale of various kinds of chemicals and scientific equipment yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, on, uh, on, on the web uh, um, ATS, uh, the, the story came up of the 115 and uh, the experiment we did. And I was trying to tell them how we did it, and I forgot what we used in the bell jar uh, to, uh, for the gamma, alpha, and uh, beta rays. And I, uh, I emailed them, and it said it was thorium oxide. And, uh, and also he emailed me that uh, I'm not sure whether it was the same – CBS production, but I saw one of them that uh, that had a real good production on what he does and and how science is falling behind, and it's really not falling behind. I mean, our secret government is so far ahead that uh, people just wouldn't believe what we're doing now. Well, just to bring uh, the listeners up to date who may not know the story, Element 115 is what Bob Lazar claimed back in 1989 is the fuel used to power flying saucers that our government somehow acquired from some other race, and uh, and uh, Lazar had said that he had a piece of it for a time period, and he even uh, conducted some experiments that, that John Lear witnessed, and uh, and which I have on videotape. And one of these days, I got to find that tape for you, John. Yeah, listen, all you guys, hear what George Knapp says? He has the videotape. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that might have been a mistake, huh? Um, but but have you been in touch with Bob about the legal difficulties he's undergoing with with regard to what he sells on on his company? Yeah, you know, he just had the court case and uh, finished that up, and now he's being real careful. But, uh, you know, the, some of the people that post say that the stuff that he got busted for is ridiculous. Everybody used that stuff. It's not dangerous at all. What uh, what, what was the end result? Did he uh, get punished? Yeah, I think he got a uh, $7,500 fine and two years probation. And is he not allowed to sell that stuff anymore? No, huh? Oh, okay. No, they're clamping down on all that what? stuff. Let's talk briefly about Area 52. I, I mentioned it in regard to the wild horses that died up there, but I'm also working on some stories about what goes on out at that place. The Tonopah Test Range, it's been a facility in place there uh, for a long time, a sister facility to Area 51. What do you think is going on out there now? Well, the real secret uh, is the uh, facility uh, halfway between Tonopah and Groom Lake, and uh, that's called Sandia. And Sandia was uh, con- talking about this secret submarine base. Uh, you sent me an email o- over the weekend uh, saying, "Hey, yeah, I'll join you for the show on Sunday, but I'm going out to my mine." What What's the deal on the mine? Uh, when I retired from uh, flying, I had this little uh, gold mine up at uh, Gold Butte, Nevada, and uh, got it. Uh, it took me about uh, seven years to get it going, and. Uh, Finally got it going, rebuilt the whole thing, and uh, and it was going there for a while. But in 2005, I made I uh, because of, there was a huge fire up there, which didn't affect my property. Uh, I forgot to file the $30 uh, registration fee that you've got to do for a claim every year. And uh, uh, last a few months ago, the BLM found out about it and they said, no, 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 you you forgot to file. So you can't have your claims anymore. So it was a great operation. I spent a lot of money, but it's all over now. Well, I don't understand. Uh, somebody else grabbed it from you, or, or no, they're no. giving it up to somebody, or they just no, no. keep it? It's just that during the time I had it, uh, they filed what they call a area ACEC, Area of Critical Environmental Concern, uh, for a million acres that they're making in Clark County for a turtle habitat. And uh, 
when it exempted my mind, but when I missed the filing, you know, for the, the few days that I did, the uh, mouse trap snapped shut and uh, there was no way to get back. Now, I appealed to the Interior Board of uh, Appeals, uh, Land Appeals, uh, twice and even went to Senator Reid and nobody could do anything about it. So, you know, life is a series of challenges and it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you meet the challenge. So now I have to clean it up and uh, that's all there is to that. I'll press on and do other things. Oh, man, that's a shame. Maybe you and I will talk out, off the air and I'll see if I can help you in any way. Let's jump back to this uh, discussion about the, the saucer, the not, submarine base. Uh, you know, I drove up to your, your beautiful home the other day, and, and you and I haven't had a face-to-face -face chat in a while. It's a great view of Las Vegas from where you are up on the mountain there. And uh, we started talking about all kinds of things, and I, it occurred to me that I have driven by this submarine base probably a 100 times, and it's always always been curious to me what a submarine base is doing out in the middle of the desert, an undersea warfare center. And and you actually, you stopped there to sort of uh, take some photos, right, and got ran away? Yeah, you know, I've been driving up there for 30 years. My folks lived up in Reno, and I go back and forth. And I've seen this there uh, and seen the sign. And, you know, up until about three years ago, it was the Naval Undersea Warfare Training Center. And then they took the, the word training out. And, uh, you know, uh, secrets... Uh, it, it takes a long time to put a puzzle together, and what you do is you take information from there and information from there and listen to people, and you read, and, you know, you're not going to find this on the Internet. You have to do it by, you know, personal contact and, uh, and listen very carefully and read very carefully, and uh, that's how I found out about it. And, you know, I did a lot of flying, and a lot of the people I flew, were, uh, flew with were ex-military, and they, they always give, you know, some little secret and they don't know that, you know, they really don't know they're doing it, but but uh, you put that together and you say, ah, okay, I got that one. But, yeah, the other day I was coming back from Reno, and I just wanted to uh, take a picture of the sign right alongside the road. You know, it's a, it's a public, it's a sign. It just says Naval Undersea Warfare Center, and I pulled over the road and pulled up my ca uh, camera to the window, and just before I shot the picture, I heard a whole bunch of screaming and yelling. I looked at the little guard shack, and they're waving their arms and running over to me. So I, I put it in drive, and I just pulled across the road, and I said, you know, is there a problem? And there was a lady there screaming, you can't take pictures here. This is a you know, secret base, and, and uh, I could call the MPs and have, you, have your campers, uh, camera confiscated. And, and I said, well, you know, I didn't mean any harm. I mean, everybody looks at this sign. There's, I'm not taking a picture of anything inside. There's nothing to take a picture of. She says, I don't care about that. You can't do this. And you turn right around. I said, well, do you think I could get a tour? And she said, no, no, you can't get a tour. <laughs> and, you know, sure. So, you know, I drove off, but it seemed a, a lot of uh, fuss. If, if I was running that base, I would certainly not do something like that. If somebody drove up, I'd say, hey, can I help you, sir? You know, uh, you know, we're not giving tours today, but maybe if you write us, we'll give you tours. But sure, take a picture, sign, whatever you want. Make it real low key there. Don't make a, a big fuss about it, because if you make a fuss about it, then somebody's going to wonder, what the heck is in there anyway? Well, yeah, it's like Area 51, you know, the, the, the fact that everybody knew that base was out there. There had been little newspaper articles about it uh, for a lot of years, and it didn't really start getting interesting until they started denying that the base was out there. Right, and you'll remember that it was 18 years ago that you released the information on Bob Lazar. And, you know, when I go on the different uh, forums, uh, like AboveTopSecret.com, uh, a lot of the people, you know, they don't believe the Bob Lazar story. And when I look back, uh, I don't blame them. Because, you know, you and I lived it. We were with Bob. We knew Bob. We were in his house. We saw him leave for work. We went up and saw the flying saucers fly. You know, and it was real to us. But 18 years later, uh, you see the story on the Internet. Hey, guy works on flying saucers for the U.S. government. They're not going to believe that. Yeah. It's amazing how much water is under the bridge since then. We'll come back to Bob in just a second. I want to, st uh, to stick with the, the sub base for a second now. Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, on the John Lear scale of credibility, how how uh, how much do you believe, 1 being least, 10 being most? 10. That that this this the shaft goes 1,400 feet down into it, and people get on submarines in Hawthorne and go to the Pacific Ocean. No doubt about it. And, uh, you know, there's many Navy facilities around the United States. I think the United States, uh, there's a, a 
vast uh, undersea area. I don't know how far it goes. Uh, I suspect that uh, there's access uh, up in Idaho to uh, Lake Pendere, probably a Kirtland, where a lot of Navy research goes. Uh, you know, I had a friend here who was in charge of the Lake Mead Naval Air Station or Naval Air Base here. And he told me of a secret facility in Lake Tahoe. And uh, just today I was talking with a friend. He said, oh, yeah, that, uh, that uh, is a real secret base. And he said he told me the story about Jacques Cousteau, who went down uh, in the submarine in 1975 to see what was down there. And when he came up, uh, they said, what would you see? And he said, the world is not ready to know what I saw. You know, and that's on record. So, well, why keep why keep this secret? You you said that there's more than one of these kinds of facilities all around the on the country, like Ohio and places like that, is what you told me when we uh, chatted. Uh, but why keep this a secret? If you can get to a submarine and get to the ocean from down there, what's what's the big deal? Everything's a secret, George. There, there, everything that the military does is a secret. You know, uh, you know that in the last few years, I've been working on uh, our bases on the moon. We've been on the moon since 1962. We've been uh, on Mars since 1966. We have at least six base stations orbiting Earth. Uh, you know, next time you watch uh, Discovery take off, it takes off on the 23rd. Just notice the time that it takes off from Kennedy and docks with a, with a space station. It's usually about 72 hours. Now, it doesn't take that long to go up there and dock. And what they're doing is they're stopping at the other space stations, dropping off supplies. When they get to the ISS, uh, usually a few days before, the Russians have sent two progress rockets up there, and that cargo was put back onto the uh, U.S. space shuttle, and then when they uh, undock, guess how long it takes them to get back to Kennedy? 72 hours. Well, you know, the trip is only 20 minutes, so they got to be doing something else, and what they're doing is they're taking those supplies that Progress brought up and going back through the line, un you know, supplying the, uh, the other uh, space stations. You know, Isn't there, like this, you know, going on, and, and it's a secret. We'll never know about it. And I'll tell you one thing. I met the other day with an Air Force uh, intelligence guy and, uh, and uh, my associate, Ron Schmidt, and we came up in my den. We talked for several days. And at the end of this time, I said, you know, uh, fellas, on a scale of zero to 100, zero meaning we don't know anything, 100 being we know everything the government knows. Where do you think we are? And our general consensus was between 0.5 and 0.7. Now, since that time, I've revised the scale to zero to 1,000, being we still know only 0.5 to 0.7. We know nothing. Now, you mentioned uh, St. Uh, Louis. You know, there's a huge underground uh, submarine uh, testing center there, and I think they access, it, access that by going up, uh, up, up the Mississippi. This, this, this stuff you know, about all these stories I'm telling you can be found on AboveTopSecret.com. The guy posted, you know, when I posted the original story on Hawthorne, he came on and said, you know, my dad worked uh, on an underground uh, uh, facility that uh, was a huge uh, body of water there in St. Louis, and he worked on nuclear submarines. You know, I don't have trouble believing the idea that we could have secret uh, satellites up there or space stations. I mean, that's technically feasible. A lot of folks don't want to believe about UFOs or whatever. That is something we could do. What I don't understand is why there's...